Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. So welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we continue our military to manufacturing series and we're very excited to have us b who is a maintenance control technician at Brady Corp. So welcome, B. Thanks for having me. Well, we're excited to have you today, man. Looking forward to uh, talking with you and learning more about your background and, and your experience and now that you're in the manufacturing world and you know, love to start these episodes. Just what branch of military did you serve in? I served in the uh, Navy. Okay, so how long were you in the Navy? I only did one term, which is uh, four years. Four years. All right. So, what what t- were some of the the roles that you did while you were in the Navy there? My job, or what they call in the Navy, uh, my rate was an aviation electrician's mate. I didn't do so well in college, <laughs> to be honest, and I turned towards the military to guide me into a technical field. And I found that the Navy had probably some of the best. And uh, I specifically chose an uh, aviation electrician position. That's how I got here today. That's very cool. I mean, th- first of all, thank you for your service. That that was awesome that you served your country. So the aviation aviation electrician, so you're working on some pretty cool stuff, it sounds like, man. Oh, definitely. I was working on uh, MH-60 Sierras, which are the Navy equivalent of a, a Black Hawk. But yeah, it was really cool. Funny story is that when I was in elementary school, a Black Hawk landed on our school field. Our librarian teacher had our National Guard fly there. Black Hawk into our field. And as a kid, I remember touching it, going inside of it. And then to actually go work on one, I think that was a pretty cool story. <laughs> pretty it all cool. came it came full circle, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is so cool, man. Well, I mean, that it sounds like you picked up pretty cool skills there working on that equipment. When you were transitioning from the military to the civilian life, what were some of the areas that you needed the most support in? I think it was definitely the OJT. Once I got out, transitioned out, I was going to school. And there was just kind of that time when I was in limbo. I didn't know what type of career field was out there for me. Um, I knew I was going for my degree, but I had no idea what kind of, you know, I didn't know manufacturing field existed. I just knew that we manufacture stuff, but I never knew there was this whole career behind it. Right. What was your exposure to manufacturing or industry in general? Very limited. I first found out about manufacturing through my college course, and it was through a POC class. And then I was thinking to myself, what is a POC? And as I looked into it, it's, you know, a computer that programs machine and they're used in manufacturing. So I thought that was a very, very interesting career field, somewhat relatable to what I did in the military. Yeah, no doubt, man. I mean, absolutely. So so you recognize that that was something that you were interested in. It doesn't sound like you had that PLC training or exposure in the military itself. So what was missing from that training to get you into industry that you wanted to uh, get started with? Definitely the uh, technical training. My college course provided, you know, just kind of the, the knowledge base. But I think what was critical was the hands-on to touch a PLC, to program the software, to put in the wires and stuff like that. I think that was critical into going to that field and not having that. I really didn't know what I was aiming for going through school. Right. I'm with you. Okay. So that kind of leads us to this topic of the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing. So how did you learn about the AEM and what was that process like for being accepted into the program? Yeah. So when I was going to school, I decided that PLC is something that I want to mess with. And I put that on my resume. And I said I had some some courses on PLC. And then about a month, a few months later, I was contacted by a recruiter for AAM. And they were talking to me exactly what I wanted, you know, PLC training, you know, the technical side. It's a three-month training. They train you on that, pay for everything. And I thought that I hit a gold mine. <laughs> I really thought that was interesting. So I decided to apply for it. So you put that application in. Were there some tests or things like that that you had to go through through that application process? Uh, I believe so, yeah. 
there's some, t some tests, and I believe a phone interview, kind of like an oral board type. Okay. So, I mean, if you look back through that experience of being at AAM, what stands out to you the most? I think what stands out the most is I felt really appreciated when I walked in the door. First day to the day I left, I really, truly felt that the staff and whoever's in charge of the program truly cared about us, and they really want to see us succeed through this program and for future. And I think that's not just me. A lot of how we felt in the program is even at Rockwell, we felt really appreciated you know, walking around uh, the facility, um, all the staff there too. Right. So you felt like people were really behind the program. It's not just something, a buzzword out there that you felt the value and the support. So that's wonderful that you felt that there going through that. So if you were to explain from a technical standpoint, you, you've mentioned PLCs a few times to that listener out there that may be you know, looking and trying to consider where they want their career to go and, and they're considering AAM. Can you explain the technical training, how that went for you? Yeah, they split the uh, technical training into different programs, into different modules. You know, let's say hardware to your software to your Ethernet and different uh, kind of divide it up. So you'll start on that module, you'll learn about it, do some labs, take a test on it. And then uh, once you pass it, if you don't pass, you will take another retake. If you pass it, then you go to the next module. And they definitely pace it through with the class. So no one really gets left behind. And the instructors are great. They're willing to really work one-on-one, -on -one, stay after, have you come in the weekend to the labs if you need to, and uh, get the work done. So is the, is the pace pretty intense through that 12 weeks? Uh, for me personally, I thought it was, it was okay. Uh, there was definitely a few modules that, I struggled in just because I didn't understand it was my forte, but I got through it with help from the other guys from the class too. And we all help each other to get through the class. So I'm curious, what, what were some of those modules that were more difficult for you? It was definitely the network side. I had a limited experience with network and it definitely, it's all virtual, you know, besides your, the port you plug into and then the cable once you go behind the firewall, it's just virtual. And it, for me, I had a pretty hard time grasping some of the, the theories or what goes on behind the, the switch and the router. Yeah, that's almost a different language, isn't it? It definitely is, yeah. Yeah, but you're seeing more and more with smart manufacturing and the IIoT devices and these all these smart devices, those worlds are crossing. So it's very good that you got that exposure because, I mean, that's definitely the way that manufacturing is evolving. Definitely. I, I'm really glad I got through that class. One of my first projects here at Brady was to build a controls network. And I was very afraid because I've never built a network before. And just going through an entry program, I didn't feel I was adequate at that. But uh, with the help of our contractor, him walking me through how network works on the control side, on the operation side. Uh, I felt more comfortable in understanding that we're going through IIoT, you know, that phase. I've definitely learned a lot within the um, year and a half I've been here. It sounds like it. I mean, designing that architecture is, is so important and having the fundamentals down for the different type of network, networks that you're looking at. I know it can be intimidating, but it sounds like you have a great resource there to learn and grow that skill set, which is going to be so helpful for you in the future career. So hats off to you. Thanks. You know, one thing that stood out when I was learning about the AAM was the professional development side of it, you know, so not only was there a focus on bringing the technical skills to the candidates, to the people that are going through the program, but they were also concerned about developing you all professionally. So can you talk to us a little bit about that process and what some of that training involved? Yeah, definitely. The first week we were there, we went through a professional training course at Manpower Management, and they did a great job. I had a good keynote speaker, went through some leadership training, and then not just that, they helped us on our interview process. They coached us. They had actual managers from Rockwell come out and do mock interviews with them, learning how to be more comfortable with yourself, talking, public speaking, or just going through interview process. Cause I, I know that a lot of people, they freeze when they go through these interview process and definitely these mock interviews 
you could tune in yourself to be more professional sitting, the way you talk, the way you interact with these uh, interviewers. It really helped out. No doubt. It sounded like there was some role playing involved and to put you in the seat, if you will, to get some experience for those types of questions. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think they did a great job. I think that's one thing I love about this program is they didn't just teach us the technical side and push us out to go get a job. They lined everything up, the process interview, getting the companies out there. It was great that we were able to question the companies that came out. You know, they pitched their position out to us and then we had a good 30 minutes of just drilling. We'll just ask all the questions and that was all on us. We were able to just ask whatever you want, almost whatever we want. <laughs> Right. I mean, that sounds like a wonderful opportunity to not, yeah. you know, to, to not only grow as a person, but to learn about, you know, potential companies. So hats off. I mean, that's just great. So if someone's out there listening right now, B, and they are really wanting to pursue this, what advice would you give them? Definitely brush up a little bit on uh, some electrical stuff, <laughs> some uh, low voltage electrical stuff, but don't be afraid. They will teach you that. They teach you all uh, what you need to know through the program. Just get through the initial test and the interview process, and you're good. Very good. So now you know, you've know you gone through it now. You've graduated. You're working in industry, and you're out there as a maintenance control tech at Brady. What do you find that you enjoy doing the most in your current role? I mean, wh where do you get that most fulfillment? I think this is a unique position that I'm in here. What I enjoy most is being able to look in these programs and clarify what this machine is doing to – the maintenance tech here. Uh, the maintenance tech, they look at the machine, it's broken, they go and they try to figure out what's wrong. You know, if it's not mechanical, then it becomes electrical and it may disappear somewhere into the program. And that's where I come in and I'll look through the program, comb through it and say, oh, this machine is supposed to run this way. And they'll say, I never knew that. And we're learning together. A lot of us were learning together. I'm teaching them how to go into, into these software and use it to troubleshoot to get what they need. Um, and I get to learn the machine so I know how to program these uh, or fix or program these machine better. So it sounds like you got a good team there that you're working with. So how long have you been out there so far? November will be two years. Okay, very cool. So has anything jumped out as a highlight maybe there at Brady or it could be a highlight from your time in the Navy that you'd like to uh, share with our listeners? Being a Brady, it was uh, definitely, this position has given me kind of a lot of insight into the manufacturing and uh, the potential it has. Seeing the gap in the supply and demand and our, the technical um, side, I came here and the guy who was um, here for 30 years, he retired two weeks after I got here. And seeing that there's a gap between these technicians you know we there's a demand for technicians i think that was just kind of something i noticed and i thought this was a great opportunity you know not just for me but for all the veterans who jump into it because there is a like rockwell say there's a void in this field no doubt it's definitely a gap so i'm curious so the tech that had 30 years how challenging has that been for you or the other the rest of your team to replace that or to understand the things that they may have just inherently known about the process since his departure. We definitely thought the plant was going to burn down <laughs> without him, <laughs> but uh, it's definitely a learning curve. The maintenance guys, they did a great job of picking it up and trying to figure out what he used to do. We tried to reverse engineer a lot of what has been done and go back to a standard of machine spec and understand this machine because we're all we're all pretty fresh uh, pretty new since he's left we we've learned a lot the, we've maintained uh, on the machines we're learning a lot on how they work uh, we learn a lot of kind of you could say shortcuts that were taken and we're undoing those and going back to a standard of this is how the machine's supposed to work keep it like that can't go around these safety procedures and whatnot right have you seen a chance for any new type of uh, digital optimization or are you bringing in any new devices to try to improve the process overall? Have you guys started that or do you think that's, you know, sometime here in the future? Oh yeah, we have, we, we brought in a SCADA, a SCADA made by the inductive automation and their platform is called ignition. So I have been given the opportunity to own it. I'm the only uh, controls tech here. So 
I mean, every day I'm pulling all the data from the POCs, historizing it, and then sort of my job right now, and this is what I enjoy doing is making these screens that it gives you more information about the machines. Um, right now, we're pretty limited in our schematics or screens. And so by building these visualized screens of machines uh, and data and information graphs, alarms, it's a tool for our maintenance guys to use that to better troubleshoot. The next project is to do a recipe control so that the operators will not have to enter, you could say, 40 parameters into the machine each time they run a product. So the recipe control will just take care of that. So we'll just get off the database, reads it, push it automatically right into the machine. The machine will adjust to it, and they just click run, it'll run. Right. So you say that main engine there is Ignition that you're using with that? Yep. Ignition is a great solution platform. And so it sounds like you're taking a lot of time from a development standpoint to focus on visualization to make that process real, to help the operators and the maintenance techs on the floor respond and understand how the equipment's running. So are you enjoying that? Yeah, that's my favorite part. I come in every day, I open up the designer and, uh, in a way, it's almost an, an artistic feel to it. You're creating a screen from blank or you're transferring from an old screen and you add your own little jazz to it, but <laughs> you still have to stick to a standard of what makes the most sense to the maintenance guys or the operators. At the end of the day, they're using it. So you have to design this to what they use it for, what will be most useful for them. So I find that you know it's, it's challenging, but I love it. Uh, I come in. And one day I might put a lot of colors or design this page to look a certain way. And then I take it downstairs and the operator's like, no, I don't like it or I can't use it. It doesn't work this way or that way. And I'll take it back, readjust it, bring it back down. So it's definitely feedback going back and forth. And I, I like that process. You beat me to it because I was going to ask you about how is the process of communicating with operations you know, how integral is that in the design of, of the visualizations that you're building? And it sounds like you're on it. So do you find out before you start that initial design of a, of a new visualization that you're best served to go interview and learn what you can about the process and the, from the operators? Exactly. Operators know machines the best. They know the machines top to bottom. They know how it's supposed to react uh, when it's not running right, how the screen is reacting. Uh, so as a programmer, I don't work on the machines. I don't operate on machines, so I'm pretty limited. And I do go down there, talk to the operators. So uh, my plan for this next project is I want to run with the operators for about a week. So I have an idea of their process flow. Uh, where do they walk to? What screens are looking? What buttons are pressing? At what time the machines, you know, whatever it's act, uh, reacting, what buttons are pres pushing? So that hopefully I can make their walk to from the screen shorter, more efficient, make the screen visualize a little bit better, more efficient, so they could just look at a screen and understand, hey, machine's, my machine is fine. So some of the aspect, we're taking out colors. It's called a, a grayscale. So the screen is gray and colors mean that, you know, you have a process that's out of control or running a certain way or alarming. Currently our screens, it's just full of colors. And you look at the screen, you don't know what's going on. So talking to the operators and understanding how they're doing their daily work is critical in understanding and developing a, a good screen for them. Right. I mean, you got to be a good listener and then understand how to translate that into the visualization that you're designing. So I think I heard it, and I'm sure our listeners out here as well on the podcast heard it also be, when you started talking about this topic, your voice picked up. We can definitely tell you're passionate around this. So hats off to you. I mean, it sounds like you have a, you found something that you enjoy that you find purpose behind and, and that's wonderful. So we'd love to take these episodes too and, and learn a little bit about people outside of work. So any hobbies that you have, do you like to share with our listeners? Yeah. Um, I like volleyball. <laughs> I love playing sports. Um, I used to play basketball and I transitioned to volleyball indoor and it was the military that, uh, when I was in Pensacola, I started playing beach volleyball and just fell in love with it. You know, you're out in the sun, it's hot, you're sweating, you're getting tan on, hit the ocean to come back and just keep on playing. 
And yeah, so beach volleyball is my go-to um, hobby. Very nice. Very nice. So, but you said you started with basketball. That was kind of where you, where you got going. Yep. Yep. Started with basketball. Basketball was fun, but at times I felt like it's a physical sport. I had a couple of injuries from it, injuries from it. So I transitioned to volleyball because, you know, you have the net divided. It's a non-contact sport. A little bit, you know, I was less prone to injuries from that. Oh. So I stuck with it. Very cool. Very cool. I mean, best wishes with that. I guess anytime you can get to the beach is a good thing, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I love the beach. <laughs> nice. Nice. So how about your family, B? Anything you'd like to share with us about your family? It's just me, the doggy, and the girlfriend. You know, we bought a house here in South Milwaukee. Uh, we're committed to this area for now. And I think it's a great place here. You know, the Midwest, it's it's pretty nice here. Nice, man. Nice. So what kind of dog you got? I got a boxer. She's four. Yeah. Oh, wow. I used to, I, I used to have a boxer, man. So what, what color? She's, uh, she's fond. Okay. Yeah. They're beautiful dogs, man. They got plenty of energy, don't they? Definitely. And then that's why we, uh, we decided to buy a house. At my first year, I spent downtown in an apartment, and I felt horrible for my dog. It was nice that we're right by the, uh, the pier, so we just walked down, got a lot of parks. But on rainy days or snowy days, I just felt so bad for her. We're, we're stuck indoor in an apartment, going down the elevator every day. So I really wanted a house, a yard, which she has now. I <laughs> And we all share it. So it's awesome. It's amazing. That is awesome, man. So, well, it sounds like you got a lot of fun things happening there in Milwaukee and bright future ahead of you. And B, we love to wrap these episodes up where we can talk about the why. On Eco Last Why, we talk about purpose. So. If you have our listeners out there, they're interested in, this, in pursuing a career like you, and but they also would like to know, you know, what's what's your drive? What what gets you going? What's your purpose? And, and how would you answer that? So, <laughs> my why is uh, I aspire to be an engineer of some sort one day, uh, controls engineer, electrician, electrical engineer. I think that was something in my mind back when I was younger, going through college. I just didn't know it at that time, and. My degree is is in electronic system engineering technology, and here I aspire to be an automation engineer. And how to get there, I just have to keep on grinding, get the certification, you know, maybe go for a master's, and that's the why. I want to become an engineer and, uh, you know, own projects. And, you know, I want to be in charge of big <laughs> million-dollar projects. I think that's amazing. And to see something from an idea and go through the whole full process of making it work, getting the right people, uh, the contract, and uh, and then managing that to the very end, finalizing it and closing it out. I think it's such an amazing process. Well, I think, B, you will accomplish that goal, and I encourage you to save this episode because I guarantee you in the future you will be able to go back to that when you're an engineer and you're, and you're crushing these big projects and you're out there hustling and making things happen. You, you may enjoy listening back to uh, the B of today. Because, uh, <laughs> right. you know, you got you got a, a great future in front of you and, and you've brought so much insight and wisdom. You know, it's a wonderful program that the AAM, it, it's kind of opened the door for you to so many different paths you could take. So we wish you nothing but the best from uh, Eco Ask Why and, and truly appreciate you taking the time. Thank you again for your service to our country. I just enjoyed this conversation, B. Well, thank you for your support, Chris. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.